Hello and welcome to The Pulse. Chief Executive Carrie Lam says that with three elections to be held in the coming year under the new electoral rules, the government is making every effort to accelerate the task of amending more than 20 pieces of primary and subsidiary legislation. On Thursday this week, the Chief Executive said the amendment bill will be tabled to the Legislative Council next Wednesday. Earlier in the week, the Secretary for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs, Eric Jung, said the government is also considering regulations to prevent people from casting blank votes or calling on others to do so. Well, with me to talk more about changes to Hong Kong's electoral system is Maria Tam, Vice Chair of the Basic Law Committee. Maria Tam, can I just first of all ask you some questions about things which are very much in the news at the moment. One is whether, in fact, it is going to be valid for people to be able to cast a blank vote. A blank vote is a blank vote, so you cannot count one way or the other. I think, uh, as far as our law is concerned, uh, you should not dissuade anybody or pressurise anybody to vote a certain way. So if people want to cast blank votes, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a problem. So you don't think that should be outlawed? No, I don't think we need to. If people want to cast blank votes, let them cast blank votes. And let me come to the other a topic which is much in discussion at the moment, which is we've seen the changes to arrangements for the election of the Legislative Council. There's now talk about changes to the election of the District Council. Do you, A, think that's necessary, and B, in what form would that be? Made. I have no information whatsoever as to government's intention, uh, what to do with the district council. Um, I don't think it's necessary to have a re-election. Uh, apparently there's going to be taking an oath by uh, district council members. Then you would decide whether they are going to be truthful to their pledge of allegiance or not. And then uh, they already set uh, sort of uh, procedures to deal with such situation. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because at the moment, in the Hong Kong system, the only fully elected body by a process of universal suffrage is the district councils. Do you think that system can remain? The basic law does not give the district council any status in terms of being able to exercise a legislative or executive or judicial power. It's a consultative body. So it's got nothing to do with elections. It's going to be something uh, that works by um, sort of explaining to government what the people feel and trying to explain also to the people why certain things can or cannot be done within the purview of the district council, which is recreation, hygiene, uh, culture, and things like that. Uh, at the moment, uh, judging from what we saw uh, since the new one was set up, uh, so there's a lot of political venting uh, and there is a lot of um, disruption. You, you mean there were the, the district councils prior to two years ago were not engaged in political actions? Because that simply isn't true. Oh, no, it? no, it's a very different situation. If you read the press, I mean, they will um, get uh, government officers to come in and then send them out and then change the minute and say, uh, you know, they are, they are being... Uh, chased out of the, uh, of the uh, meeting room. I thought the government officers withdrew. No, 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 no. Before that, it was milder, much milder. But right now, that seems to be the general practice. Well, let's... Which is very sad, which I is see. very sad, but, but, because but it's a I waste of from, public I take, revenue. I take from what you're saying that you do, in fact, think that the system of election to district council should be changed. 
No, since you asked me this question, and I don't know what the government is thinking, no, I'm, asking and I'm, your telling, opinion on I'm that. telling you that there is possibly a taking of oath by the district council members, and whether they take the oath truthfully or otherwise, or whether they are really uh, honest about it, uh, there is already a set rule when the uh, when somebody, a candidate, joins the ele uh, uh, election for the legislative council. There's already an electoral officer who can administer this particular part of the proceeding. And likewise, uh, I think you could do it with the district council members. Okay? So I wasn't thinking about re-election. No, I was just but asking about the actual basic the system can do, of election. One other thing the government can do is add some appointed members. I see. So you'd uh, like to see some appointed members, the old system of having no, appointed members. No, I'm saying members. that it has to be more balanced. I see. Let me talk more generally about, which I think is more within your comfort zone, is um, the basic law in Article 68, which talked about progress towards universal suffrage. As we know that in, um, even as early as 1988, 33.3% of the council was elected by universal suffrage, it's now going to go down to 22%. How could that possibly be in line with the requirements of the basic law? First thing I need to clarify, that universal suffrage has got nothing with the, uh, to do with the joint declaration. Because no, I'm asking UK, you about the basic when, law. No, no, no. Let's start from the beginning. So it is something that is prescribed by the basic law. And Article 45 for universal suffrage of the chief executive in 68, for universal suffrage of the legislative council. Ever since reunification, the central government and the Hong Kong government has been pushing forward, 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 forward. The central government in 2014, while people are already talking about civic, uh, civic nomination, rather than following Article 45, the basic law, and the Legislative Council was getting uh, a lot of filibustering and even fights, in the Legislative Council, the political atmosphere was getting so bad. The Standing Committee on the 31st of August You're talking about the Standing still Committee come of up, the National still come People's up Congress. with the decision that Hong Kong can have universal suffrage election for the Chief Executive for 2017. So the honesty, the, the wish to really deliver Section 45 and 68 of the basic law is there. Who turned it down? The oppositions turn it down. They don't want democracy. They, well, let want, me just... they want a system which bypasses the basic law. Okay, let me just but ask you about the, the, the facts that of the matter. cannot happen. But you don't dispute no, the facts that, of the matter. After that, after that, 2014, you have 79 days of Occupy Central. 2016, you have the Mong Kok riot. 2019 to 2020, oh, oh. mm. we have over a year of terrorist activities. Terrorist by activities? This, Can I just stop you there? Well, terrorist because by do definition, you, do you yes. Think, do you think terrorist too, by, uh, do you activities think, by definition do you, do you, are people do you, using do, violence and throwing petrol bombs? Can I ask you, do you, think, bombs? do you think that a demonstration by literally millions of people is terrorist activity? I'm not saying they're terrorists, but what they're doing could be qualified as terrorist really? activities by definition. A peaceful demonstration is a terrorist activity? No, no, activity. no, some demonstrations are not peaceful. No, but, not, I, I, but you've said it was a period of terrorist... I was saying terrorist activities. I wasn't saying terrorist demonstrations. I see. Two, so, two separate issues. I see. So okay? you're saying that during that period no, what, there was what terrorist activity. What I'm saying activity. is that we have tried moving towards universal suffrage, mm. And according to the basic law, it's supposed to be the final. Wait till the end. We didn't wait till the end. We were trying to do it in 2017. So it's about 23 years earlier, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is the fact that we have to revamp this uh, electoral system is to make sure that Hong Kong goes back on track in terms of law and order and good governance and development? Well, the fact of the matter is, I mean, you, what you're saying is it's justified because of what happened. But the fact of the matter is that under the proposed electoral changes, which after all have already gone through the MPC, 
it will just be a case that 22% of the 22.2% of the seats <laughs> will be e elected by universal suffrage. That doesn't look that's like for the, progress. That's for the next term. That's for the next term. We still got another 25 years to go. What we have to do now is to build a solid base where we can actually have people when they pledge allegiance, they really keep to it. We want patriots to be in the mainstream when it comes to the governance of Hong Kong. Once we establish that, we will be able to assess next step what to do. The ultimate aim hasn't changed because this time we only amended the Annex 1 and 2 in respect of the election of the Chief Executive and the Legislative Council. We have not amended the actual article 40, 45 and 68 well, that's, it says that, that, that we is, will get universal that is the case at the end. So just so to clarify, can I make sure I understand what you're saying? Just to clarify what you're saying. <laughs> you're saying that I don't think you dispute that, that there has been some going backwards in terms of um, a popular election. But what you're saying is that, OK, that may have happened, but then there will be a period of going forwards more more direct elections or, or not? Definitely, because the first thing is to establish the principle um, <coughs> that Hong Kong will be uh, governed by people who are honest to their pledge and who are patriots, which is a very simple description by Deng Xiaoping in June 1984. He says a patriot is somebody who respects his ethnic origin and he truthfully supports China exercising sovereignty over Hong Kong, and he will do no harm to Hong Kong's prosperity and stability. So anybody in Hong Kong could be a patriot. That's the first thing. Once we establish that, the next thing is, according to Article 45 and 68, we will assess the actual situation and we will make gradual move, but towards the goal which hasn't changed at all, even at this moment. That is universal suffrage for both at the end. I think just to clarify, what you're talking about was the decision was that there would be universal suffrage, but it would only be for candidates who'd been nominated by the election committee. But that's in the basic law. No, no, I'm just saying, just to, to, just to <laughs> clarify what you we were saying. We don't have a party system. Yes. We don't have no, a party whip. Indeed okay. we don't. And in respect of, uh, okay, the chief executive, uh, the decision uh, on uh, August uh, 2014, 31st, uh, hasn't changed. Likewise, the ulti ultimate goal of having universal suffrage for the whole of LegCo hasn't changed. Let me just interrupt you for a moment. We'll be back after the break. Welcome back, and we're continuing our discussion with Maria Tam. Let me just go back to what you said a moment ago. Um, you, you, you quoted Deng Xiaoping as to who could be considered a patriot. What do you envisage as being a legitimate opposition within the LegCo? Look, if you're an MP in, in UK, you pledge allegiance to the monarch. If you commit treason, you'll be disqualified. If you are a senator in the United States, you pledge to uphold the Constitution. Every single country is being administered by people who are patriotic. Okay, let me just stop you so there because you've are, given an example we are of Britain. Just establishing a universal you, rule you, here. You've given an example of Britain. In the British Parliament, one of the largest opposition parties is a party that seeks to break up the United Kingdom. That's a national, that's a national level of governance. No, Here, no, they wish, they wish to, to secure independence from Scotland. But yet they are a legitimate party within the UK Parliament. I mean, you, you give examples, but the examples don't match no, up no, to no, reality. I'm, I'm, I'm giving examples to show there is a universal requirement. But the universal requirement is not, not to exclude people who disagree with we the system. We don't exclude. We don't so exclude. So who, who, as I who said, is included I, in that then? Everybody, as I was telling you. If you fit the description of what well, I told you. Let's not talk theory. Anybody can come Let, in. Let's not talk theory. Let's anybody talk, can come let's in. Let's talk about what we know in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, do you think 
for example, the Democratic Party, the Civic Party, the League of Social Democrats, these are known entities. Do you think they could form part of a legitimate opposition? Of course, they're pondering over it now. They're discussing what to do with their future. They're talking about You don't about think their candidates elections. would be disqualified? If they hadn't done anything, which anybody can put their fingers on and say, look, you know, this is something controversial, no problem. By all means. So all of the existing opposition parties, and again, we don't need to talk theory because they exist, you say could come forward for election. Opposition party or not, as long as you don't harm Hong Kong and you respect your ethnic origin and you truthfully support China's exercising sovereignty over Hong Kong. You see, Hong people Kong. from those parties would no, say... you have to ask them. You have well, to ask them. If I have asked them, and they would say... Mm. In fact, I know because I've asked them precisely okay, this. very good. They would say mm. they, they, they fulfil all of those criteria. OK, then they can come forward. There's no problem there. The only problem, you say, would be if they had faced charges or they had been convicted of various offences. Because the problem is that the leaders of all of those parties are all under investigation or are awaiting trial. Oh, then you find somebody else in the party. There's always a second generation. And you don't think they would then also be um, awaiting well, trial? Well, I don't know. I think if they come in, then there will be a test and, uh, you know, uh, the electoral officers can make a decision and then you can have... Uh, well, there won't be electoral officers anymore. Uh, yes, I agree, yes. yes. OK, uh, talking about LegCo, there will be an uh, eligibility uh, committee, OK? Oh, and they'll be, a, the, uh, they'll be the vetting by the police? The eligibility committee uh, mm. has information from two sources. Mm. One is from National Security Bureau, or committee. Another one is any other uh, sort of requirements mm. that you have to, uh, to fit uh, to be a candidate, OK? Now, the second part, you can always do petition, election petition. But the first part in respect of a decision of the National Security Committee, you cannot. You can't. I mean, uh, under the is, current system, you a, could it, appeal. It is, no, under the present system, the, the election committee hadn't come in at all. No, no. Under, I'm, I'm just saying, there is a uh, fundamental change, because under the current system, a yeah, decision yeah. Of an election officer, you know this. No, if um, the, the, it could if, be subject if, to judicial review. Of course, but but if that is it, going to stop. There is already in the NSL a section which says a decision of this committee cannot be JR, cannot yes. be judicial reviewed. Yes. Likewise, well, that's a big change. It's a it's a proper change because when it comes to matter of national security, I assure you. In many places, even when you're going through a trial, it is not open. The information are not automatically 100% disclosed. We are just following that rule. See, the reason I'm asking all these questions is that when the national security law came into force at the end of June of, of, of this uh, of past year, mm. we were told by Carrie Lam and indeed by other people, oh, mm. it will only affect a very small number of people. Um, there's no need for the rest of the population to be concerned. That doesn't seem to be how things have panned out. No, it's a matter of evidence. If there's no evidence, then, you know, they can just walk in the streets, do their shopping, have dinner with family. Nobody will disturb them. If there is evidence, then the police can act on it. What it's about if they evidence. take part in I mean, a, in you, a, in you a demonstration? To, you, you, you have to um, look at the case individually. Uh, the people you talked about, the leaders are already under charge. Why can't they run for election? The simple fact is that there is evidence against them that they do not, uh, may not, uh, we hadn't got a trial yet, they may not comply with the requirement. So it all depends on the individual. If you have acts and deeds which require investigation, then fair enough, you don't get the chance. But if you haven't got any of those things, you just do whatever you like, join the election, and then, you know, just run. OK, I think that's very clear. Can I just ask you something else which um, concerns, if you like, the, the pro-Beijing camp? I, I don't know how you um, <laughs> describe it. But, uh, you, you know, we, th there's been a lot of discussion about unhappiness in Beijing with the capabilities and, if you like, the um, professionalism 
of people in this camp. We had um, the, the Beijing-based academic um, Tian Fu Long, who, who, who comments a lot on, on uh, Hong Kong affairs, describing people in this camp, some people in this camp, as being loyalist uh, you mean, rubbish. You mean, uh, oh, you mean uh, rubbish in the pro establishment yes, camp? Yes, yes. Mm. So I'm just wondering if another um, aspect of these electoral reforms would also affect people who've been strong supporters of Beijing and have been in the pro-government no, no, camp. No, if you ask me, if, if you have two candidates for the same seat, I would definitely, I mean, assuming they're both patriots, which meets a very mm. simple requirement that I spoke about twice, I would definitely vote for the one with ability. So, but this is the question, is do you think that there is a problem in the, in, in the pro-government camp that, of competence and general ability to do things? Well, I think it all depends on the individual, and it's nothing to do with in what camp. Whichever camp you look into, there are better people and there are less able people. As in life, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I mean, but, but there has been specific... But I think it's not fair. <laughs> I, you can point you your finger at any political party and say, a, that guy is incompetent, that guy is incompetent. It's just that there has been specific criticism about no, no, the people fact within that the an camp. An academic talked about mm. it doesn't make it universal truth. Uh, obviously <laughs> not, but uh, what I'm asking you, because you are well connected in Beijing, whether you, you have sensed any dissatisfaction with the capabilities of people who are indeed uh, supporters. Well, they hadn't told me. You don't hear any of this? No. Well, that's interesting. I talked about a system. I, talk, I don't talk about individuals. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think, um, and i just ask you this finally, do you think that, that there is space within the pro-government side of the spectrum for new forces? I mean, there, there's a number of well-established parties in that, in that era. Do you, do you think that it would be improved by having I think new forces be entering? Because what's going to happen is that uh, I think the uh, election committee should be looking uh, for people who are representative of their own trade or profession with experience in um, maybe um, different uh, sectors I mean, they would have to be people who are either representative or well-known or with proven uh, performance. And uh, for that reason, uh, they can enrich the combination that we have now. Well, Maria Tam. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very Great much talking indeed. talking to you. <laughs> and that's it for us for this week. We'll see you next week. Goodbye.